Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm joined again by Michael Brenner. Michael is a professor emeritus of international affairs at the University of Pittsburgh and fellow at the Center of uh, Transatlantic Relations at John Hopkins. He was on this show before explaining the emergence of the neocons. If you haven't seen that video yet, I highly recommend it. Um, Michael recently wrote an interesting essay called Defeat, and in it he reflects on the horrible situation in Ukraine and the nearing defeat of NATO's we will bring Ukraine into the alliance, whatever it takes, approach. Uh, that's what we want to discuss today. Michael, thank you so much for coming online again. Pleased to be with you again, Pascal. Um, Michael, let's let's dive right into it. Uh, your essay on defeat. What? Why did you write about that? And why do you think defeat is near? Well, I think defeat has to be understood in, in two frames of reference. I mean, the narrowest and most concrete frame of reference across is what is happening in, in Ukraine. Uh, and what is happening in Ukraine is a dismantling of Ukrainian armed forces. And the military outcome, I think, at this point is, is foreseeable and really preordained. When the Russians sort of launch a massive uh, offensive, which is being prepared uh, right now, whether later this year or perhaps after the new year, uh, it will succeed and the military outcome, I think in the people who really know military and strategic affairs, unlike most American uh, media or so-called uh, pundits, agree unanimously that this will happen and that it will succeed and the Russians will be on the, uh, on the Nyepa, uh, which means total defeat for Ukraine, military defeat. It probably will lead to the downfall of the Lansky government, although one can't really predict just what new leadership might emerge and materialize in, uh, in Kiev. So I point, main point of reference is that which I take as, as a given. But of course, for the United States and for its uh, sort of, you know, Western European partners, uh, Ukraine has only been the, the occasion, if you like, the focal point for pressing a, a wider strategy, a strategy which has, the, has had these ends uh, from the very beginning of the crisis or really from a period of a year or so before the actual sort of crisis uh, arrived. And that is to weaken Russia gravely. Well, let me list them in, in, in descending order of importance, but inverse order of likelihood of success. The maximalist objective was regime change in Moscow. The hope, the aspiration was that humiliation and or sort of, you know, defeat either in the crisis stage or, or as the result of successful Ukrainian military action or so or Russian failed military actions, that uh, the position of Putin would be undermined, that there, uh, he likely in effect would be overthrown. Uh, by uh, insiders, spearheaded, no doubt, by disaffected sort of oligarchs. And then you would get a more Western-oriented, pliable regime uh, in Moscow that would seek accommodation with the West on essentially on American terms. Russia would be neutered as a political force. It would be marginalized in European affairs generally. And uh, the strength that it represents would be subtracted from the sort of Russo-Chinese partnership, which is seen as the paramount challenge to American sort of hegemony. And uh, the strategy had as one of its main instruments, of course, not just the, a military or security confrontation in, in Ukraine, but also the hollowing out 
and eventual collapse of the Russian economy. It was expected, and this was uh, a view widely held, almost unanimously held, both in Washington, Brussels, and in European uh, capitals, uh, was that the Soviet economy was fragile, that it could not withstand a series of heavy blows, including sanctions, boycotts of, of Russian energy, it's being uh, denied access to the SWIFT system, which would result in a financial breakdown within Russia. And that therefore the destitution that would follow uh, would result in mass discontent. And so perhaps mass protests and demonstrations would, would create the, the occasion for those who would be willing and ready to topple Putin to act. So it was a combination of things, but that was the maximalist goal. Obviously, it was based on a series of, of false uh, assumptions, and uh, it has failed totally. The, if we drop down a level, I think the goal was, and perhaps still is seen as being a, a possible outcome and a reasonable objective, is to so weaken Russia by imposing the financial and mil military costs of this prolonged campaign on it, that uh, it would find itself uh, unable and disinclined to pursue a really assertive foreign policy or a foreign policy which in any way sort of challenged uh, the primacy and the control of the US, NATO, and the EU over all of Europe. Right? And there's still, you know, hope springs eternal. And in many corners in Washington, particularly in the neocon, they hope that if they can just prolong the war long enough, that this sort of weakening of both in economic, military, and most important in terms of Russian morale, might uh, might result. That too, though, I think to a reasonable and reasonably objective observer is highly, highly un unlikely. Right? Uh, so the, the inability to create the conditions in which any of these American, essentially American, formulated objectives uh, could continue to be seen as a reasonable outcome uh, places the United States and its dependent Western allies, we can call them that, I think vassals is, is, is the more appropriate term in a purely descriptive way, uh, in a bind. They don't have not only any good alternatives, they don't have any, any feasible alternatives, particularly given okay, that the, the Western narrative has been so disengaged from reality that neither the leadership nor the political class nor publics throughout the Western world are prepared for the kind of defeat which is being inflicted not only on the battlefield, but we're being inflicted on Western diplomacy. And I think when things really become crashing down in Ukraine, which is carried, you know, the, the full weight of these overblown ambitions and goals, it's going to be stunning and it's going to be galling because it's going to demonstrate uh, that Western power and influence in the world is far less than it was assumed to be. Not only that, it was less than always has been taken granted. The greatest shock, of course, will be in the United States. And there has been no preparation, either diplomatically in terms of contingency plans, in terms of, of, of beginning to somehow instruct the, the American people about the realities of today's world. Right? So that too will mili militate against coming to honest terms with where things stand and when the crash comes to somehow deal with it. And so then we get into the psychology of, of, of defeat and how you handle defeat 
and that was the, the main theme of the essay to which you referred. Yes, and um, that's it. I think this is exactly where we have to drill down. What you are laying out, I'm completely in agreement with. Um, it a lot of this of this story that the West told us of what would happen and how Russia would be defeated um, came crumbling down bit by bit. I think the first thing that went away is the idea that the world is against Russia. The world, the entire world is in agreement that, you know, Russia needs to be defeated. Suddenly, after about half a year, even the neocons figured out that, wait a second, we cannot ignore anymore two thirds of the entire planet. We cannot ignore the fact that South America, Africa and all of Asia is basically not on board with this. Uh, I think that was the first part that came down. Then came this whole idea of, um of this is now uh, russia will will crumble economically that didn't happen and i think the west is, is kind of not talking about this anymore I mean, you can see that the infamous oil price cap it's just mm -hmm. not being talked about anymore it didn't work but it's not being talked about anymore and the my big question though and that's where we have to go into this psychology is that this war in ukraine on the one hand i completely agree is a huge strategy to defeat China and strategically also, uh, sorry, defeat Russia and strategically also defeat China or try to take on China. And the neocons are currently spinning it in exactly that way. They make the linkage. The linkage was before not as, as explicit, but in their mind, I'm pretty certain they saw some some benefit in that from the from the beginning. And now they're making it explicit, especially with that uh, uh, um, Republican commercial that I'm, I'm sure everybody has seen. Um, but this war was also basically a propaganda war toward us, us citizens of the West, right? The in in the US, in Europe, and also to a certain extent in Japan, although at a lower level, they, this was a big propaganda stunt of trying to make to sell to us that we're the goodies, they're the baddies. And we're gonna go and give it to them, like, and we're gonna help the the the, the these Ukrainian patri patriots to defend their country. And even that narrative is coming apart because recently Can Canada just honored <laughs> a Nazi, <laughs> just honored a Nazi in their parliament. And so the, the 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 story is crumbling, and it's it's becoming obvious that even on a on a on a national level, there might be some sort of rethinking with Slovakia now. Uh, you know, electing an, a, a party that is that is that is not not in favor of Ukraine and and wants good relations with Russia. Um, so, can we now talk about the what you're terming the psychology of what this defeat will mean and how, especially the neocons, will spin well, this? Let me uh, let me preface that by first saying that I think you depicted the situation you know very very well. Uh, and if you permit me, though, to take one exception, I don't think that this reality, which manifestly, objectively speaking, there's no doubt about, has indeed been accepted and absorbed, been absorbed by, certainly by the Biden administration. And that includes, above all, the neocons, but even those who are not dogmatic and ideological neocons, but have shared, and they have come to share, the essentials of the neocon worldview. I don't think that they as yet see the grand scheme of things in a realistic way. There's propaganda, there are two types of propaganda. There's propaganda directed at others or your, your own people in which you want them to believe certain things and therefore to act in certain ways. And then there's propaganda, let's not call it propaganda, the second type is script writing, in which you actually believe yourself in the script that's being written. It's not fiction. It's not something that uh, you are trying to tutor your own people or the world into believing. But rather, it is a design that indeed is reflects your own conviction. And there is this in, incredible, unprecedented disjuncture, discrepancy 
between the way in which the American and Western political classes generally view the world and reality. And until those two are brought into focus, you know, reasonably soon and to a reasonable degree, any talk of adaptation to realities which reflect the failure of policies uh, is going to be very difficult. And the degree of Western leaders, and especially American leaders, but um, it's not restricted to the United States, although the script has largely been written in the United States, have been living in a fantasy world. They've been living in a fantasy world characterized by uh, an ability, what they presume to be, an ability of the United States to continue to maintain its position of global hegemony. How we define hegemony is a subject for another conversation, but a unique degree of dominance, even though it is taken some uh, historically unique sort of forms that is involved, not just, uh, it's been a shadow empire. You know, it's been a shadow empire formed as much by control of the world's financial system and monetary system. And, and rule setting for trade as it been through uh, military means or physical control. But the, the conviction remains in Washington that this is a natural state of affairs and that it's sustainable. And the, at the same time, there is a, uh, I sense an unconscious sense of diminishing or threatened prowess. The United States historically has always thought of itself as being exceptional, was born in a state of, of original virtue, that it, it was fated by providence or whatever, by a teleology of history to lead the world. And that's what it's done for the last 70 years or so. Right? And now you become very anxious at any sign that this might not be true, and the signs of the manifest uh, are twofold. The manifest capability and power of other, other parties, right? And two, a greater difficulty in working your will. And the United States has recognized the main threat as being China, right? Supported and supplemented by, uh, by Russia, and it has therefore preemptively, if you want to call it that, declared China a, a mortal enemy. What kind of enemy? Well, if you look at the reality of things, China is not a threat to the United States, it's not a threat to American security. It's not a threat even to, to you know, the United States' ability to uh, to prosper. It's not a threat to a very prominent role and influence in the world. What it is, is at the core of things. And here I'm talking about the American psyche, not just the American psyche, but this is now manifest consciously in things that, like in planning documents. What it really threatens is this uh, singular American sense of of prowess, right? And the way you, just one other point, right? Uh, one way you react to this, of course, is to compulsively try and demonstrate that indeed you're not in decline through muscle flexing. And I think many of the things that we are doing in reference to China and many of the, and, and, and the sort of unrealistic and we sort of fantastical attitudes towards Russia of this form of com of emotional compensatory muscle flexing on the part of a country and its leadership, which is really unsure that it's going to remain the supremo in world affairs and thereby fulfill its destiny. And this makes it enormously difficult to adjust and to accommodate what's happening in Ukraine, because Ukraine in and of itself is no great importance, 
and frankly, Americans, despite all the, the amount of, you know, ostentatious displays, certainly American leaders don't give a damn about the welfare of Ukraine and certainly not if Ukraine. But Ukraine came to carry, and this was a willful act, action, the full weight of American ambition and objectives in the world, and that is to maintain essentially global hegemony, Europe and, and worldwide. Yep. It is quite interesting. And it's also, you know, we need to look at the different levels of of world order and what the impact of the Ukraine war and now more and more the defeat of Ukraine in the West then is on world order. Because on the one hand, the neocons, Blinken and so on, they already tell us that Russia has already lost the war. Russia wanted to uh, eradicate Ukraine. They didn't succeed. It's like, okay, this is this is stupid. That's not what Russia wanted to do from the beginning. And okay, but go ahead, Mr. Blinken, spin it that way if you like. Um, the other thing that they're telling us, oh, and they lost because Sweden and Finland came into NATO. So Putin got the, op the, the opposite of what he wanted. This one is more interesting because I do believe that Sweden and Finland joining NATO is is the is pretty much the opposite of what Mr. Putin wanted. So I think in this in this sense he's correct. It's not as dramatic because Finland and Sweden have no open disputes with Russia. They are not enemies mm -hmm. in the sense that that Ukraine was little by little turned into an actual enemy a, enemy of Russia. So it's not as dramatic, but it is something. But but on the other hand, in the larger picture. Um, Ben Norton was on another channel, was making that that uh, uh, argument just a few days ago. What China has is sovereignty, much more sovereignty over its own economy and over its own digital space, its own apps, its own infrastructure, its own its own hardware. And that is something that the, that the United States is definitely not accustomed to, that the United States is accustomed to be to be able to put pressure on other states by regulating their own uh you know producers manufacturers apple and uh, and 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 all the others and then have that tickle down right and thereby have other states especially europe japan fall in line when it comes to uh to playing along in 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 the order that the united states creates same with the swift system with the banking and so on right global infrastructure is either provided by the united states or in very tightly controlled through its through its uh, little institutions that it created that the the, the World Bank and, and so on right and this is something that China created itself and it's now creating an alternative structure and it's creating an alternative structure through the BRICS uh, with other states with Russia and so on so in this sense the structural power that the United States was accustomed to and the West is accustomed to have is now being rivaled and seriously rivaled, not just by China, but by others that do not want to play along anymore. So in that, in this larger picture, it's actually the West that kind of undermined its own interest and that got now the opposite result, a speeding up of new global infrastructure that's not uh, Washington-centered. Um, do you do you see that also happening? And is, are there even more layers in, in your view? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, the, 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 the conclusion you reach and your sketching of the fundamental elements of, of a new global system uh, really uh, cannot be challenged, cannot be argued with. But that assumes that there is a, a degree of dispassion. There is a degree of clear-sightedness, if you like, of uh, objective observation in Washington and European capitals, which I think manifestly does not exist. Uh, so let, let, let's come back to how the U.S. is maladapting to the failure, R.E. Ukraine and Russia, and then get quickly into the broader picture in terms of the global system as a whole and, and the even more fundamental and basic modifications that already are occurring right the essentially the u.s strategy for 
dealing with the coping with, right? The cognitive dissonance between the script that they've written and actuality really has, has, has three elements. One is you, you restate and reformulate the goals. And this is what Lincoln did. And, and as you correctly underscored, in other words, you no longer talk of success yeah, in terms of uh, significantly weakening Russia, or certainly not of, of undermining Putin, of regime change, or anything of the sort. You don't even talk. You don't talk about the, the sort of grave crisis in the Russian economy. You don't even talk anymore about the restoration of uh, Ukraine's borders circa January 2014. You simply ignore that. Instead, you highlight, or you try to highlight, what they claim are indeed successes. Finland and Sweden joining NATO, which in strategic terms is absolutely meaningless. You know, the notion that Russia now must contend with a 1,500 mile longer border as if we were on the, the eve of World War II or World War I breaking out, which is another fantastic idea that has gained wide circulation in, uh, in the West. You talk about the fact that you have protected uh, Ukraine from being gobbled up by Russia as if Russia wanted to. It totally absorbed Ukraine, another fantastic uh, idea. The second thing you do is you, em you, you, you emphasize ancillary benefit, unprecedented display of NATO unity, right? Unpleasant, unprecedented uh, demonstration of the ability to concert diplomatic and economic uh, aspects of facets of you know of policy right uh demonstrating the limitations of the russian military because here they are still fighting 18 months uh, whatever it is it's about 18 months since they they launched the uh, uh you know the operation if you like in february february 24th so you you scale back the goals and therefore you redefine the measures by which to calculate success and uh, you know and failure. Uh, another thing you do, and this is really the main one, is that you cultivate amnesia. Some of that amnesia, of course, takes the form immediately of, of, of forgetting what you were saying and declaring 18 months ago. You forget what your original goals and objectives were, both in public statements, and there's a certain amount of self-deception as well. I mean, here we're talking about elements of psychopathology, and it is not customary to bring in these kinds of elements, even psychological factors generally, in analyzing the behavior and attitude and conduct of statesmen of major power. But I think unless you do that, you really cannot get a grip on what's going on, what has going on, the state of mind and the, the likely future behavior of American leaders or quite a number of people in Western European capitals uh, as well. So that's sort of short-term amnesia, amnesia. But let's remember in terms of, in regards specifically to the United States, uh, the United States has had a lot of experience with memory management. We've honed our skills to memory management. See, if you have been observant and had the opportunity to observe American reactions to a whole series of failures, beginning with Vietnam, and then moving on later in the war on terror, in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, right? Or well, garden a variety of failures, you know, Cuba, Venezuela, Niger, in which American designs were stymied and thwarted. There's a very clear pattern which has emerged, and that is 
you efface it. It wasn't many years after the Vietnam catastrophe that Americans ceased to re re mention, refer to, or think about Vietnam. It didn't even appear in, in school textbooks. I happen to know that since I looked at the ones that nieces and nephews used. And it wasn't totally ignored, but it was simply slighted and paid no attention whatsoever. So if given the time and the opportunities, the Americans mind, both of its leaders and therefore through the various mechanisms of social control and with the connivance of the media who no longer serve their classic function as being, you know, the fourth estate, uh, critical of commentators on the conduct of government, uh, that would be relatively easy to do. Ukraine would just fade away the way Vietnam faded away. But now we come to, you know, the main theme. The world has changed. And that change has been accelerated by not only what's happened in, U in Ukraine, but by the actions the United States has taken. You know, uh, best example is SWIFT. Mm -hmm. SWIFT was supposed to be a neutral mechanism to manage financial transfer. It's been used as an instrument for leverage. Mm -hmm and indeed for for theft for uh, you know for coercion for damaging an opponent by in effect stealing their assets of course it began with venezuela's access iran's access but when you steal 300 billion dollars of russian assets it gets much more attention and any country you know concerned about its own well-being will begin to feel anxious about placing their money in financial institutions, in the American one, which is susceptible to this kind of expropriation. And that's why all of the talk about from Saudi Arabia to China and India and every place in between about gradually developing an alternative to Western financial institution. And that's a dramatic acceleration of a process which we would have proceeded much more slowly if we hadn't had the sort of dramatic effect, the actions associated with, with Ukraine. Two, the United States in, is simply not prepared diplomatically, above all, um, intellectually, in terms of, of, of self-conception of, of its place in the world to deal with, to, to negotiate a multipolar world. Yeah, but- Polar, I don't know whether pole is always the proper term, but it's been actually very well described by, by Putin in his speech today in, in Valdai. Uh, what it means is a dispersion of power and influence that uh, many and the most important states have become keener on, on exercising their sovereignty, not necessarily for, for selfish ends, but for simply self-interested men, and therefore a much less readiness to defer to the international hegemon, which is the United States. It means an adjustment of international institutions, it means the loss or the weakening of important levers of influence, particularly financial ones and, and commercial ones. And it means putting a premium on diplomatic skill, which the United States at this point totally lacks. We had more sophisticated and nuanced diplomatic skills during the Cold War than we do today. It has been uh, commented upon by many people, including a uh, very impressive American former diplomat who demonstrated those skills, like Charles Freeman. Uh, he's retired now for a number of years, who continues to write and address this issue. Uh, and they, frankly, are, are deeply disturbed and very pessimistic about the United States' talent uh, and ability to sort of handle the new challenges which require skills that uh, they don't have, that American leaders don't have. How you adapt to that is much more difficult than adapting to failure and defeat in the Ukraine. 
you know, as we said, amnesia accompanied by these other little tactics, if you like, it does the job very well as far as the United States internally and the American public class is concerned. It's wholly inadequate when you talk about uh, adaptation to a new world that's structurally very different from the one that the United States and its Western allies have been accustomed to, and which they thought had sought uh, relentlessly to confirm and reinforce uh, over the past, uh, you know, decade when the first Chinese challenge began to began to appear on the eastern horizon. What what you're saying is very fascinating, and it plays. I mean, it it. I, I think you're you're right with this analysis. The interesting thing, of course, is that multipolarity by its very nature, doesn't depend on the okay from one or the other power, right? That's the whole that's the whole fun about it. It's like if we go into a multipolar system because China and Russia uh, can now do certain things, even against the will of the hegemon that previously provided all of the infrastructure and they built their own infrastructure, then that's that that allows them to do to do things now and that enables, New way ways of 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 communication and 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 frankly also diplomacy. The interesting thing, of course, is that the the diplomats you're talking about, and I must stress this, the United States has or had had some of the most brilliant diplomats of the 20th century. Uh, George Kennan, Jack Matlock, Chas Freeman, and and uh, they are they are all. Re- re- well, retired. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, Kennan died in two thousand five or six, right? But they were some of the most brilliant people, and also like during the Second World War, Joseph Grew and so on. The people in the State Department were brilliant, and and um, they understood world politics to a degree that is absolutely uh, admirable. Now, these people, um, also during the Cold War, they were there. And this kind of this management of the Cold War, we must say, although there were the United States and also the Soviet Union, they did proxy wars and they did they did they did exploit vulnerable populations like Vietnam and and also Korea and uh, to fight off their 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 um well the fight for primacy right. Uh, but it was managed. We didn't blow ourselves to pieces, and yeah. that we didn't do that. Is to a large degree the uh, um, owed to the diplomats and the statesmen who actually didn't want to do that, and in, in also in the in the Soviet Union we know that, and Gorbachev and so on uh, were these these kind of people who then really tried to de-escalate and come to an agreement, and then we entered thirty years of unipolarity, thirty years, and the people who are now steering the ships, they are the ones who who came who during thirty years came to be accustomed in the US and in the West to being, you know, to be the power that did it. And in a sense, I, I see how this, how, how this, I, how this generational shift has a, has a very, very big influence of how, how these people are now thinking about what multipolarity is and, or, or how to, how to approach it. And they approach it the way that they know, which is just steam, like uh, steamroll over it, right? The way that you steamrolled over Iraq and it was fine and Afghanistan, it was fine and Libya and it was fine. And now suddenly it's not going to be fine anymore. So um, how, how do you think that this generation that, the Blinken and the Newland and the Bear Baerbock is even younger and and you know even even uh, in in Germany Schultz and so on they they all they were young when 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 the when the Cold War was still going on and then when the formative years were the unipolarity years um, how do you think they will now react to this? I think they react with a pattern which is well established in 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 the the psychological literature, second literature, psychology, behavioral literature. Excuse my going back to that. Nope, do first, do. first is denial. That's the first step. Uh, and we're also very good at that. And so is Western European counterparts as well. Uh, second is becomes, you know, avoidance. 
right? Because avoidance is very difficult because when new, new powers, new actors appear on the, you know, on the scene, uh, whether they take the initiative or they resist your initiative, it's not easy to, to avoid them, right? Uh, the, the third step is normally making minimal adjust, adjustments, not just the following, minimal adjustments in your worldview, in your strategic uh, conception of things, in the broad lines of your foreign policy. Now, we haven't even done that. We haven't even reached that stage, right? And only under enormous pressure, whether it be for cognitive dissonance or tangible adverse effects or new, you know, security threats and challenges, uh, normally are people prepared and to whatever extent capable of examining the core principles, the pillars of their thinking about how the world works and how you can sort of navigate in that world. And we are so far removed from that. And the changes that are occurring are so fundamental and now accelerated that in fact it is really hard to be at all optimistic that we are going to be able to make, make the adjustment and you're quite right this generation of american let's say political leaders generally but also foreign policy uh -huh, uh, really don't have the aptitudes and the outlook that would facilitate making these sort of adaptations and policy adjustments, just the opposite. Why? Well, you'd have to dig deeply into American culture, society, whatever. Everything from, you know, crude careerism to uh, the way in which people reacted to the triumphant moment at the end of the Cold War to socialization into this particular era of American policy, of a, a world affairs when American singularity and exceptionalism seem to be confirmed with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, you know, the, the, the kinds of, of a very uh, fuzzy, simplistic, but nonetheless, you know, popular notions like the end, the end of history were taken up by supposedly sort of, you know, serious people. All of this together produces what you have. And what you have now, uh, not just the officials in the Biden administration, but also look at the officials in every preceding administration, from Clinton through Bush, the junior, uh, through Obama, through Trump, through Biden, they all essentially have shared the same worldview in its, its, in, its founda in its foundation. And what you have now, and this is why using the term neocons can be somewhat distorting, is because the neocons, yes, they have the militants that you like, and they're the ones who animate things, and they're the ones who are particularly active in, in, in promulgating and proselytizing in name of a particularly uh, drastic and dramatic view of what the world, uh, how the United States could and should remain hegemon. Although let's remember this was first outlined by a person who was not really a neocon, which was Paul Wolfowitz. Paul Wolfowitz was this very senior official in the Defense Department. Uh, he became one of the authors of the War on Terror. He's the one who first prodded Bush to, to invade Iraq, right? World War II, this famous memo, which everybody should look at, in March of 1991, in which he stated and laid out in very bold and bold terms, if you like, how, why it was compelling for the United States to use all of the levers of power at its disposal to entrench its position as a dominant world power and how to do it. And it included everything from preventive war, that is striking countries who might not, not preemptive, preventive, who might be hostile to you down, down the road, right? To trying to cut down to size any rival who might appear 
before they grow to dimensions where they could actually challenge you. Right? Uh, and this really became, at the time, the memo leaked, it was rejected by George Bush, uh, the elder, if you like. But this really became the, the, the if you like, uh, it was from that that derived the script. It the became gospel. literature, which had been in, for what is almost universally accepted with slight variations and modifications and qualifications, you know, the uh, overwhelming pervasive consensus among the American political class, particularly the foreign policy establishment, as to how to understand, to view the world, and what policies and strategies to follow to advance this goal which is now taken as given and unquestioned to do whatever necessary short of nuclear war to maintain the United States' dominant position. So that's where, that's where we are. And you, you have less variety, diversity of thinking about foreign, the most fundamental foreign policy questions in the United States today. You know, whether you're talking about the administration, whether you're talking about the think tank world, whether you're talking about foreign policy, community or establishment, whether you're talking about the media, certain, whether you're talking about the university, think tanks, far more unanimity and, and uncritical and, uh, and unquestioned consensus than you ever have had in American history, except maybe during, during World War II. So how you break out of this is very difficult to see because you don't have the individuals who by insight, understanding, conviction, integrity, and political aptitude and skill uh, uh, will be able to break this intellectual you know, ice jam. Uh, it would be nice if somebody outside the United States could prod us, could, you know, try and, and, and exercise, a, you know, chisel a few few blows into this structure. But of course, the Europeans won't. I mean, they are, well, let's not get into that. I mean, your European leadership is, is hapless and hopeless. And they have, they have become total intellectual and, and emotional dependence of the United States for a variety of historical and very, complicated reasons and and then look at the caliber of people not that they are any lower than those in the united states but can you imagine a mr sunak uh, a, a a a a a mr schultz right and mr borrell or even you know macron who's really i think preoccupation is to become an ambition is to become president of the European Commission, which explains all this high blown, relevant, totally irrelevant, uh, irrelevant to contemporary problems and, and issues. None of them, none of them contemplate, much less implement or try to uh, break or contribute to a breaking up of this, you know, deleterious consensus which has all of the Western world, and certainly Washington, if you have Washington in your grip, you have all of the Western world in its grip. Yeah, the, I, I must say, though, you're completely right. And the political class at the moment, and also the diplomatic class, unfortunately, uh, in, in, in Europe and in the United States is absolutely hopeless. Uh, and I am very sad about that. But the thing is that there are good people. I mean, in the U.S., you, you yourself, Chas Freeman, the uh, and also uh, you know Stephen Wald, um, the um, um, Mearsheimer, and so on. There's a lot of people who get it, who understand it, and there's also young people who do. Um, the colleagues I know, um, but the thing is, they don't get into this. They don't get into the system, right? They are not. They're not. This is not the these kind of thinkers and these kind of people are not the ones who then make it to the top, uh, not even in the State Department anymore. They used to. 
they used to be in the State Department and go to become ambassadors, but not anymore. Like today, a lot of ambassadors of the U.S. are acolytes of the current uh, of the of of the current affairs, right? And and thereby the system kind of becomes it shields itself. Perpetuating. Sorry. As it becomes self-perpetuating. It becomes self-perpetuating. It does, and it starts pulling a Ceausescu on itself. It starts. It starts making itself like uh, um, it, it's. It's then impenetrable to like what's happening on the outside. Now, what of course then on the other side, on the international sphere, when once we have the other poles, etc., it we will confront this block with this. Rea new reality and it will it, it will impact it will take a, a, a long period of time and this is where this is very interesting what you said psychopathology and understanding the psychology with this new world this new reality will do to this um to this block and blob of people and 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 and, and narrative in power that is not going to be alone anymore um do you think that we should care about individual psychology and try to analyze the people in power and how they think? Or should we try to analyze the psychopathology of institutions, you know, of the U.S. presidency or of the U.S. Uh, the, the, the Senate uh, in the sense of how these institutions, how these institutions also might have, might be susceptible to psychological um effects or 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 logics well it's all of that of course and, and ultimately you have to look at the society you know the social system and and its culture and so forth and how that has evolved and taken on certain characteristics over the past three four five five decades and the kind and how it socializes its people, the way its reward structure, the kinds of behavior that it encourages, the kinds of behavior it discourages. Uh, I mean, and and you should look at it in those broad terms because here we're talking about not only the degradation of a particular, the holders of a particular office, the presidency, or particular departments or departments of government. You know, the State Department, the Pentagon, or whatever, are, or what's going on in, in the thinking and the attitudes of Congress, or they really don't care very much about foreign affairs in terms of, of making a serious attempt to un understand it. They, they play it largely for politics or, or simply as occasion to emote, uh, you know, and, and display the sort of you know, atavistic and visceral, you know, feelings. Uh, you know, you can do that, but at the end of the day, it comes down to, to individuals. And if you had, well, well you know, a, a willful uh, person, a great conviction, and, and who was able to attain the office of the presidency, make appointments, uh, these other factors and structural elements might be impediments, but I think could override them, which won't be easy, obviously. But no such person is going to arise because don't forget the system operates, the selection of leaders operates not just at the, at the stage of, of election or nomination, et cetera. The weeding out occurs much, much earlier. Uh, and nobody's going to to make it beyond the first rung unless they accommodate themselves and accept the basic ethos as well as ideas that have become an orthodoxy and an orthodoxy which is reinforced. Now you mentioned some of the people which uh, you you compliment would be like including me among them, I really don't have, you know, their experience and background and, and, and status. Yes, there's some quite remarkable persons there. Now, most of them, if you check their age, though, this is a, you know, generational phenomenon. A few, but relatively few really younger people, they're all marginal. And marginal in the sense that none of them, not a single one of them would 
be invited to write an op-ed for an American newspaper. I'm talking about an American major newspaper. None of them. Freeman has been denied access to the New York Times or the Washington Post. He's totally ignored. Nobody ever calls him to get his comments about something. This is the man who accompanied Nixon and Kissinger as the official interpreter to Beijing in 1970, 1972. Nobody will. Nobody will interview him. He'll never appear on television. And none of the other people you mentioned, and we could add up the names, maybe a dozen, 15 of them, they only appear here. Here, by here, I mean, you know, YouTube, you like that. They have websites like you have. If you look at the number of people, though, who actually visit those sites, even on good days, in absolute term, it looks considerable. Sure, I mean, you don't have 330, uh, you know, million people who are, are, are robots in, in the United States. I mean, you know, a few of us are freaks, but <laughs> uh, but it's in relative terms, it's minuscule, absolutely minuscule. Yeah, you know what the, you know that, and you, you know what the budgets of some of these outfits are. I know, I know, we are realists, but you know, when it comes to hope in realism, uh, my hope here is that a lot of small voices will also form a chorus that can be heard. So uh, I'm glad and we have a lot of little channels and we have a lot of little outlets and you're sending your essay on defeat. I think you're sending it out in your mailing list, but it reaches people and it it, it can amplify. And that That's my hope because we need to burst that bubble. This, this, this thing over here needs to somehow be pierced. Well, this is, you know, this is, you know, it's, it's maybe it's the American equi equivalent of Samizdat in the old Soviet days, except you don't get thrown into prison, although you might be thrown off of, uh, of Facebook, you might be thrown off of Twitter, as a curve. It Scott, will Scott Ritter, for example, been thrown off Twitter yeah. some years ago, yeah. thrown off by uh, whoever the previous owner was, and now by this character, Musk. He's been censored by Zuckerberg uh, on, on Facebook. So, yeah, I mean, these people are very serious about maintaining this, this encapsulated, yeah. uh, you know, view of the world. May I make one other point, Pascal? In a sense, I think if we detach ourselves from you know, the events of the moment, the passions as well, and, 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 and put things in, in historical perspective, uh, the last uh, decade or 20 years or so could also pre presented could have presented you know, to be an enormous opportunity to make a smooth, really smooth adjustment to a new world system. A world system characterized by the things we and others have, 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 have described. Uh, because what the principal requirement would have been a meeting of the minds, first of all, the first order of things among the leaders of the major powers. And essentially that when we the United States, China, and Russia, and then you bring in others as the process unfolds and through various forums, you know, the Indias and the Brazils, etc. I'm not thinking of a condominium of power on the, the, the European condominium that appeared after the uh, Congress of Vienna in, in 1815, right? But you need lead, leadership to, to give form and structure and to initiate. Right? And when, you look at, you, when you look at the leaders of the two powers, who presumably are the challenges of the system, that is Putin and Xi. And I'm going to say things which are not only unorthodox and unconventional, but uh, 
most people reject out of hand. Uh, and that is you had in, in them leaders who were extremely well qualified, you might say exceptionally and rare individuals with whom an American president of other dispositions and, and vision and so forth could have engaged, right? They are highly intelligent, extremely, extremely well, well informed. I mean, Putin's mastery of detail. I mean, compare him to Joe Biden, who at the time doesn't even know where he's where he is, right? Or any other American or Western European leader, right? Highly rational, and uh, very disciplined and self-control, right? And who does view things in historical and global perspectives. Now, I think you could say some of the same things, things about G, but his personality is less well known. He doesn't express himself as effusively and in such detail and as rigorously in terms of his ideas about the world as, as Putin does. But certainly a man who is in, and also in control of their own societies. In other words, they're in a position, could have been, they could be, could have been in a position to make very hard decisions and to offer up a very original prescriptions for the conduct of foreign policy and definitions of national interest because they were in such strong positions. That's certainly true of both of them, of, 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 of Putin and Xi. And we don't know enough about, about Xi, but certainly he's highly intelligent, highly rational, unemotional, disciplined, uh, not rational. And in, in, if you look at Chinese history, tradition, um, China is not instinctively inclined towards imperial control and occupation, domination, and aggression. No, they haven't been Gandhi and pacifists, but if you're talking about the kinds of challenges to a state of clothes that have been posed historically. By by rivals to the, the you know you know the sitting great power, the very China is you know is a very different animal actually. So there was a great opportunity there, and 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 I'll just say one other thing. I mean, the place this would have started would have been for an American president, a Roosevelt, or maybe even a Kennedy, right? to have first one-on-one -on -one meetings, and you sit down with a man like Putin, who well, we could speak very directly if you've seen him in action and answering questions and dealing with questioners and so forth. Uh, he doesn't shrink from direct exchanges. You, you, you sit down, you, sit, you, you share you know, a drink or whatever, and you go through the mouth and you say, uh, Mr. Putin, what do you want? How would you see the world 20 years from now in your place, in, in Russia's place in it? Uh, Mr. Xi, what do you want? And then they'll ask you, well, what do you want, Mr. President? And, uh, and then you carry on from, from that. Yeah. My instinctive feeling, which is, isn't worth very much, is that you could have, on some basis like that, engaged them as individuals if you had an American leader and president of exceptional quality. Instead, we've gone in absolutely opposite direction. We've declared them all mortal enemies. And in effect, the United States has unilaterally, let's face it, that's what it's been, has unilaterally declared a new Cold War against what both Russia and China, which thanks to maladroit American diplomacy, now do constitute a very solid bloc. And this, this is the root of why we are not getting to the condominium that we were talking about before, why we are not getting to the 1815 moment. Um, to get there, what you need is all of the great powers to actually recognize each other as great powers. And we know that the Russians recognize certainly the Chinese and certainly 100% the United States. We know that because they keep saying so. The United States is a great power. We don't mess with them. I mean, but we, we will 
we 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 will stand up for Russia. That's what they are saying. But they recognize the United States as a great power because of, obviously the Chinese too, but the US and in in conjunction with it, you know, it's 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 satellites, the Europeans and, and, and Japan, they don't recognize Russia or China as a great power. They recognize them as somebody who wants to come up, and so you need to you need you, you, you need to slam them down, right? So as long as this recognition doesn't come that the world is actually multipolar, uh, as long as this bubble still believes it will it can dominate and it just needs the right strategy in order to bulldoze over the others we won't get to the condominium phase where we get the 1815 conference which is absolutely what we need to have if we want a bit of stability for the next uh 40 50 60 years as 1815 was able to do it um, yes. and yes. the psychology question of yours is essential for this one in order to figure out it, when and if and when the bubble will be ready to accept the others as what they are. As that's that's the same question, of course. So, but let me just quickly qualify something. I, I don't. My very loose conception of things is not quite the Congress of Vienna condominium because that was what sort of six powers who would then control everything and 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 and, and keep the. Uh, you know the reserve on, on the manage and on, on the control. I, I I would as I said I say this would have to be a much more open process, which would at different stages and different ways bring in a much wider range of of, of countries, you know, and and uh, and states. But let, let me make one perhaps last last point, which is. An additional handicap in the United States, self-imposed, is willful ignorance. I mean, American foreign policy leaders, as demonstrated by statements and behavior and actions they've taken, really are pretty ignorant about things like what makes Russia tick, what makes Putin as an individual tick what the political dynamics of Russia are, and the same thing even to a greater extent, China. Uh, you know, the, the, I strongly suspect, and the, the, on the basis of personal knowledge I know about one person, right, highly placed in the administration, they never bothers to read, to pay any attention to all of the very sophisticated, sort of detailed, extensive speeches and articles that Putin has written. Mm -hmm. I don't think I don't think there is a single well, I won't go any further further than that. You know, willful ignorance kind of goes hand in hand with memory management. They are they are like the brothers and sisters. You no. need them to to have a common narrative in the society. Exactly, and it's much easier to, you know, to manage memory uh, if you have trained yourself to forget inconvenient things and inconvenient truths. Now, that's become a feature of American political culture and public life generally, and in this sense, you know, back to the point that you can't understand the people who who rule us outside of you know a, a much broader socio-cultural context. Michael, you gave me a lot of insights and a lot of uh, food for thought. I would like to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pascal. Michael, you gave me a lot of insights and a lot of uh, food for thought. I would like to thank you for that. And cut. Okay, I'm going to stop this here. Okay, that was